Okay, so the last three chapters form a natural progression through the big picture of biology. As you probably noticed when we started this whole lecture series, we started really with small things, with molecules. And then what did those molecules do? And then how did that add up to larger organisms and evolution? And then at the end, we get to the, the big picture. And so chapter 18 is an introduction to this big picture where it talks about ecology and what's behind it. And so getting started, the first thing we need to understand is what ecology actually is. Well, ecology, as listed here, is the scientific study of how organisms interact with their environment. And this means that anything that happens to the organism, based on what happens out in the environment, can be a part of this. Interacting with um, other kinds of organisms, certainly. Interacting with the climate, how natural selection acts on the organism, all of those kinds of things could be considered part of ecology. So it's a very broad aspect of biology. Now when we look at the, environment, the environmental characteristics, those are the things that of course influence organisms directly, then we can divide them into two major parts. The first one of these is called the abiotic characteristics and included there are all the things that are not living. And as you can see here, this includes things like temperature, soil moisture, carbon dioxide if you're a plant, oxygen if you are an animal, various aspects of the habitat that are not under the control of any organism. The second part of these is then the biotic characteristics, and the biotic characteristics now include things that have to do with organisms. So whether it is an organism of the same species, whether it is a mate, whether it's offspring, whether it is the tree you live on, those are all biotic characteristics. And of course those are fundamentally different. The biotic characteristics are to some degree controlled by organisms and then the abiotic ones are not. And of course we are still very much a subject to these abiotic characteristics. I mean, we live in an area that can be very hot and very cold, and there's nothing we can do about it. We can mediate those extremes by air conditioning and heating, but we are still really at the mercy of the environment when it comes to what the temperature is actually going to be. Or if you live in Buffalo, New York today, you would end up with, you know, five feet of snow in front of your garage and more to come. So those are the kind of things that we, even as humans, really don't have much of an influence about. Now, studying the environment is the kind of thing that I do. It is part of ecology to simply figure out what kinds of organisms there are and how these organisms live. So you're picking a small aspect of ecology and you're contributing it to the larger theme. And so here, for example, in this image, you see that there are some of the students, some of your colleagues from one of the previous trips we took, and we're in a coastal forest in Southeast Asia, and we're looking for all kinds of organisms, and, and some of them are new species, and uh, we're studying them in their habitat and trying to find out who's there. Now, when it comes to the discovery of new species, we mentioned this uh, already when we talked about um, e evolution, um, one of the things that you can do is contribute something that's unique to our knowledge of the environment. This is something that nobody else had considered before, otherwise it would already have a name. And of course this lizard is the picture on my office door. So these are the kind of things that you do when you study the environment, when you uh, contribute to ecology. It turns out that when you look at how you study this, you can really break it down into four distinct levels. Four distinct levels of ecology. The first one of these levels would be organismal ecology. And organismal ecology means that uh, you pick a single individual. And by that definition, this is the least inclusive level of ecology. And when, it, when we say the least inclusive level, we are really only looking at how one individual copes with their environment. Now here, as an example, is the rear fluke of a whale. And one thing that you might want to do is tag that whale with some kind of um, device so that you can follow it and then 
try and figure out where it goes. There are ways by which people do this. They use satellite technology and figure out where these whales go. And so you can observe, for example, what its movement is on any given, given day. You could also observe what happens uh, to diving. Is it looking for food? You can count uh, how many whales it interacts with during this existence. And so there are, are a variety of things that you can figure out just from looking at the individual. And of course, the assumption is that that individual is going to be very similar to any other kind of whale that's in that same environment. And so when it comes to the, the, the very basic level, you may just start with a single organism. The second level is called population ecology. And in population ecology, what you're looking for is, you guys don't know where we are, huh? Did you find it in the book? Yeah, I found it. Okay. So one of the things we can look at is how organisms of the same species interact with one another. That would be population ecology. And so in this case, you pick your area, you pick your species, and then you find out how these organisms interact with each other. And this would then include things like how easy is it for them to find a mate, how many of them are there, are they in a very dense distribution? Does this population grow very quickly? How many offspring do they have in a reproductive season? How long do they live? So there's all kinds of things about the organisms and their immediate interaction with their own kind that become part of population ecology. The third level, which is now a little bit more inclusive than population ecology, is community ecology. And community ecology now includes all the different species that you find in a habitat. And so here you're going to look at a relatively broad aspect of species interactions, not just with in one species, but with all the species and all the populations. And so you would find that in this case you could look at food webs. Who eats whom? Uh, clearly in this picture you can see that there is a, a weasel of some sort and uh, the, the weasel might eat insects, the insects might eat plants, there's a bunch of flowers there that need to be pollinated. All of those kind of things would result in interactions between different species. Some of these interactions don't have to do with eating each other. They may be providing shelter or a place to lay eggs. Those kind of things may also be very important. And then lastly, when you put it all together, it, we call it ecosystem ecology. And now you're not just looking at the organisms that live in a place, but you're also adding the abiotic characteristics. So now this is where you would add in the temperature, the moisture, the soil conditions, all of those kind of things. And as part of that, you would look at things like energy flow or chemical cycle, cycling. Those would be really large scale phenomena that you can observe. Now clearly, if you stand in front of the forest and you're trying to study the ecosystem, that's going to be a rather daunting, if not impossible, task, simply because these ecosystems are very complex and it's very difficult to factor in all the possible ac interactions there are. And so in most cases, people will start with one of the lower levels of interactions, perhaps an individual, perhaps the population level interaction. And sometimes when you have enough of those types of interactions to figure out, then you can draw from those observations and try to put together the bigger picture. So it's very difficult to uh, describe an entire ecosystem perfectly and comprehensively with everything included. There's always something else that comes up that people didn't observe. And one of the things uh, you'll find is that as we are studying our environment, even today, we, we still find really interesting new interactions that we just don't know about. For example, the largest beetle species in the world, which can be a, a beetle that's about seven inches in length, we know what the adults look like, but we have no idea what the grubs look like. Nobody's found the grubs yet. And based on other beetle species, the grubs are often a little bit larger than the beetle at, that comes out of it at the end. 
So you're looking for perhaps a 10 inch grub with the body diameter of probably five or six inches. Now that's a big grub. That'll make a good meal. That's a, a, a grub the size of a chicken, basically. But we haven't found them yet. They exist in tropical rainforests. We know the adults, but we don't know where they come from. So we're missing pieces, and this is something that apparently we're always going to encounter. When you think you have it all figured out, you're still missing a piece. And that's the first part of this.